Hey everyone, before I start this podcast, I want to quickly let you know about my new Patreon. For me, this Patreon is an opportunity to do more of what I love while getting a little extra financial help finishing my theology MA and taking care of my family. For you, it means rewards for your patronage, such as early access to podcasts and new book projects I'm working on, all of my books in digital format, a special bi-weekly podcast that will discuss biblical theological issues, as well as analysis of a theologically relevant movie selected for that episode, and the ability to see and discuss with me the work I'm doing completing my MA and book projects along the way. At the highest support tier, you can also get autographed physical copies of my books, a shout-out in the podcasts, and the opportunity to suggest a film for me to discuss in the exclusive Patreon podcast. If you'd like to check it out, and be aware that you can be a supporter for as little as a dollar a month, visit www.patreon.com slash cantusfirmus. You can also click the Patreon link on the sidebar at cantusfirmus.com. That's cantus-firmus.com. Thanks and enjoy the show. Listening to Cantus Hermes at the Movies. I'm Cody, and uh, my guest today is Dr. Graham, Dr. Andrew Graham. Dr. Andrew Graham is a licensed mental health counselor, a nationally certified counselor, and a board certified professional Christian counselor, providing professional counseling and consulting from a Christian perspective. He serves as the chair of counseling at Hope Sound Bible College and is adjunct faculty at several other undergraduate and graduate institutions. Dr. Graham and his wife, Lisa, live in Hobe Sound, Florida with their eight children. And I've also been uh, had the privilege of uh, taking um, some graduate level uh, counseling courses from him and I uh, think was excited to get him on. So how are you doing, Dr. Graham? I am wonderful, excited and honored to be a part. Thank you. So so the film that, that we um, are going to be talking about, the one you'd picked, uh, Saving Mr. Banks, uh, it was made in 2013, directed by John Lee Hancock, who also directed The Blind Side. And um, it start well, before I, before I talk about the cast, I might go over a very simple plot line for it. It, it depicts uh, Pamela Travers, P.L. Travers, the, the author of Mary Poppins, her um, meetings in 1961 in Los Angeles with uh, Mr. Disney and others at the Disney Corporation as they were trying to obtain the screen rights to her novels. And because the stories were so personal to her, based as they were around childhood events and traumas, she was very reticent to give up control. Uh, and that's the, the conflict in the film that's uh, trying to be resolved. And so we, through flashbacks, we sort of see how all, uh, you know, her, her own kind of history and how this relates to this narrative that she's crafted and, and why it is so personal. And we have a, a pretty great cast here. So Emma Thompson is P.L. Travers, Pamela Travers, uh, Tom Hanks is Walt Disney. Uh, which is interesting because you rarely see Walt Disney depicted in a film by, by someone else. Colin Farrell plays her father, Travers Goff. Um, Ruth Wilson uh, plays her mother. And Paul Giamatti is Ralph, her chauffeur. Um, there's also uh, there's some of the writers in the writer's room. Bradley Whitford from The West Wing and Get Out. B.J. Novak, who plays Ryan in The Office. And uh, Jason Schwartzman, who's one of Wes Anderson's stock care, uh, actors. So uh, a pretty, uh, pretty well-rounded cast and, um, uh, you know, number of other people besides that you look at and go, wait, I've seen him in something. Uh, so, uh, but yeah, so why is it that you wanted to discuss this film? And when I kind of brought this idea to you, this, this was what when you brought up. Yeah, so in my undergraduate work here at, at Hope Sound, I, I travel a decent amount. And so when I'm away, I often have my classes uh, watch a documentary or a Hollywood production such as this that you know relates to the content that we're talking about in class and sort of puts skin on some of the concepts that we're talking about and this is a this is a this movie is something that students watch in lifespan development which you know some cases some places that would be called human growth and development or uh, developmental psychology something like that and uh, you know it's 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 a fun it's a fun you know, not a comedy per se, but it's a, it's a fun movie because so many of us uh, from my generation and the generation before and after mine 
are familiar with the storyline uh, of the movie Mary Poppins. And, and so this sort of builds on top of that. It sort of fills in some gaps. In fact, if you watch, if, if someone has watched uh, Mary Poppins in the 60s or the, the, the movie from the 60s and they watch uh, this 2013 movie, it's going to fill in some gaps. So you're going to say, oh, wow, I never even noticed that component before. And uh, so, yeah, it's, 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 it's always interesting and uh, good family, uh, family content, nothing objectionable. Uh, so, yeah, it's a good it's a good it's a good movie it's something i enjoy I watched it with my own older children and um so i felt like it'd be something valuable to share yeah so um when you talk about sort of the, the connections between um, her real life and and um what's in the in the film and sort of bridging that gap and and also just kind of why you would show this film in those particular um, uh, sections of those classes um what, what's the connection there for you as you watch this film so, you know, I'm, I'm heavily influenced in my doctoral studies on the concept of attachment and attachment theory, the idea that our early childhood experiences and, and interactions with our primary caregivers sort of create the template upon which uh, our later relationships are developed and later experiences are sort of perceived. And so that really comes out in, in this movie. As you noted in your synopsis, there's lots of, lots of flashbacks um, related to, to, to P.L. Travers, the, the author character, and that shows, shows the viewer why some of these components um, sort of come out of her early childhood experiences. So I haven't, I ha interestingly enough, I, I've not read the book. I do, one of my, uh, one of my teenage daughters did enjoy reading the, the series of books. And I remember several years ago, her coming to, uh, to me and my wife and saying, you know, this, this character, Mary Poppins, you know, is, is very dark, you know, it's much darker than the, than the Disney film. And so my wife actually read sections of uh, of the book, uh, the the novel, and came away with the same sort of thing. Like, wow, this is a different spin on on the character as I remembered her. Um, so I should clarify that I'm not uh, I'm not <laughs> I'm not a Disney expert. I'm not a a Mary Poppins expert um, per se. I've I've enjoyed watching both of the, both. The, the newer film and the the one that it sort of reflects upon. But I noticed uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, somebody mentioned, well, the last time we watched this in class, I guess it'd be a couple months ago now, uh, somebody mentioned, you went to some website that talked about uh, any sort of movie that's based on a true story and tells you the, the points of the plot line that may differ. And so I'll, yeah, I found that interesting, but doesn't necessarily, in my mind, detract from the purpose that I was planning to use and have used uh, this this movie for. But an important clarification I felt like I needed to make. You know, I'm not a I'm not an expert on the the content or the accuracy uh, of the content as far as true to life stuff. But it does seem to be the you know even the the websites that I read did seem to acknowledge that much of the much of the major themes are. Um, you know, historically accurate. Sure. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's a fair point. And I'm not totally sure about all those details myself, but I think uh, for the purposes of this conversation, when we refer to Travers and the writing of the of the book, we'll be reflecting on how, how she's presented in the film, which may in some ways differ from reality. Right, yeah. right. But but for, for, for the purposes of, of our discussion here, I, I think we just have to deal with what the content that we have in front of us as far as, uh, you know, because that, that's, where, that's where the connections are going to be, so... Yeah. Um, right. So th th this kind of idea of attachment theory, that, that the relationship we have with our parents or our earliest caregivers shapes, you know, how we um, how we develop later in life. Um, I wanted to talk about that a little bit more because it does seem that our families are very significant for our development for better or worse. And perhaps maybe on the more negative side, you know, you have 
you know, Freud talks about this a lot and um, Aldous Huxley kind of runs with that in, uh, in the book Brave New World where um, there's this sort of future society where children aren't born anymore. They're, they're created <laughs> in these laboratories and then, you know, developed by the government, by the state so that they can be best suited for their work environment and where they're going to have to live and all this other stuff. And the idea is that in this book that, you know, when you have parents, they mess you up. <laughs> and um, <laughs> Freud seems to think that, you know, or seemed to, thought, seemed to have th thought that most neuroses could be in some sense attributed back to the early stages of your development, your relationship with your parents, that kind of stuff. But, you know, more positively also, I mean, you know, in theory, the family is supposed to be where we're nurtured, where we, where we mature, where we become responsible adults. Evangelicals in particular, I think, have emphasized that more positive um, idea or portrayal of the family. So for you, you know, in your experience and also watching this film, how do you see some of that stuff shaking out? So, you know, it's always interesting to me if you go back to, um, since we're talking about films, right? If you, if you watch something from the, the, the late 40s through the, through the mid 60s, let's say I love Lu the television show I Love Lucy, for instance, when, when the Lucille Ball character is, is expecting uh, little, she's going to give birth to little Ricky, uh, she goes to one area of the hospital and her primary source of emotional, physical, financial, relational support, right? Her, her true life husband um, and the, 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 you know, the actor who plays her husband as well, same person, is quarantined to another section of the hospital, right? That in the time that she needs to feel safety and security the most, the person who provides safety and security for her the most is the person or one of the people who is kept from her. And you think about how 40 years later, 50 years later, that the idea of that concept is, is completely to foreign to, to new fathers like, like you and I are. Um, only one of my children was born in the hospital, but uh, you know, very much part of that process. And, and any concern from previous generations about any sort of infection or whatever that might be present by having you know, a foreign agent in the room is, is taken care of by the fact that we recognize that people get better faster. People report um, lower levels of, of pain or higher levels of pain tolerance when they are accompanied by or supported by someone that they see as a source of safety and security for them. Hmm. So if you go back, so what, you know, where did that change happen? You know, and, and a lot of that, you go way back to, um, to a, a physician in, in the United Kingdom back in the thirties, a guy named John Bowlby, who is the guy who wrote books on, you know, like the title of one of his books is simply attachment, which is sort of where we get the, the early structure of attachment theory. And the idea there was that, you know, our mothers, you know, it was his, his idea. Our mothers are those are the ones who provide us our, our social, emotional and cognitive development. You know, prior to that time, the assumption was whoever was feeding you, Right. Whoever, you know, is much more of a behaviorism sort of sort of mentality. Whoever's whoever's feeding, whoever's holding a child at the time is the person that they trust. And so it didn't matter if it was a surrogate, you know, in a hospital setting and, or, or school setting or that sort of thing. And so Bowlby recognized that kids in the hospital system that he was working in in London, you know, in, like I said, in the 30s and, and 40s, Kids who were cared for by their primary caregivers um, got better faster. And so ended up spending a lot of time, you know, in a sense, sort of devoting his life to this idea. Had a number of students who devoted their lives to this idea as well. And, you know, as the theory developed, it was recognized that it wasn't just our, it wasn't just our mothers that give us a sense of security. Uh, he, for instance, Dr. Bowlby had a student who um, moved to the country of Uganda because of her husband's employment. And in that particular culture at that particular time, the grandmother was the primary caregiver because mom was still had more, oh, I hate to use the word, but more utility working out in the field, whatever. And so anyway, you just sort of 
various studies throughout the throughout the 50s and 60s and even 70s that sort of clarified and and honed in on some of those sorts of things but basically the idea is that you know even even as infants we're sort of hardwired to seek out our primary caregivers for for support and for security and particularly when that doesn't happen um you know pathology relationship distress those sorts of those sorts of things result um in saving mr banks you know we discover that you know pl travers uh, which isn't even her name but the the the, the author um of, of mary poppins has had this very chaotic very traumatic um upbringing some very key interactions with her primary caregivers and and the lack of support that she received from them and how that very clearly comes out not only in her writing of the mary poppins story but also just the the journey of her life <clears throat> both what's shown on the screen depicted on the screen and and what isn't yeah and so we can't really discuss this film the way we are without giving some spoilers so you know we are going to do that you know. um <laughs> but yeah so basically for uh, you know pamela or as she calls herself later um she is growing up with a father who um you know seems to be very caring likes to you know really enjoys play so he's in a lot of ways different than the mr banks that we see in the film who's much more serious um you know he actually so but but he's also he develops this issue with alcohol. He becomes an alcoholic. He does work at a bank, like Mr. Banks does, uh, but he's not this, you know, you know, kind of. I don't want to say he's not hardworking, but but he, you know, shows up drunk and you know, almost loses his job a number of times, and maybe sort of has some of the some opposite problems where he uh, isn't quite serious enough, I suppose. Uh, but as she is sort of getting older and you know, um, seeing more of who her father is she sees more of this struggle with alcohol addiction and you see him sort of earlier in the film where he's always wanting to play with her. They're always sort of using imagination and that kind of thing. And then later in the film, as he's sort of being bedridden, he actually becomes slightly cruel, I think in some ways that surprise her. And her mother is, I think just kind of done with the whole situation. She's, you know, tried to get him to stop drinking. She's tried to be patient, but nothing's working. And, uh, in, and at least in the film, she um, sort of stops her mother from committing suicide. Uh, I don't know if that, that actually happened in her life, but it's a, it's a pretty dramatic moment in the film. Sure, yeah. So my understanding is that the, um, you know, P.L. Travers' mother did attempt suicide. It was not, it was not the, you know, the childhood, you know, the early adolescent P.L. Travers who saved her. Um, which is sort of how it's depicted in the movie, but you know, the mother very much was emotional, uh, both in, both on the on the screen and in real life. In my understanding, uh, mother was very emotionally distant, very, um, very you know, very insecure person. Uh, struggled very much. The family moved quite a bit, and that's depicted on the film as well. Uh, the father, you know, did lose his job a number of times, and, and there's this quality that that clearly. Clearly, P.L. Travers um, loved about her father, you know, was this this playfulness, the silliness, the the voices, the characters, the um, you know, very much a taking time to entertain his children. Well, in the in in the Mary Poppins, you know, film based upon her book, there's it, it's as though there are two characters who sort of. Um, together make what I think would be the ideal father in her mind. You have, you know, probably the main character or a main character um, in the movie is, of course, the uh, Bert. You know, who's who's played played by Dick Van Dyke, who's this very silly and happy-go-lucky, and he, you know, has a number of different jobs. You know, there's no, there's no, uh, there's no shame in the fact that not only does he gain employment by being a one-man band and drawing chalk pictures on the sidewalk for, you know, for change, but he also is a chimney sweep and, you know, various other, you know, roles and responsibilities. He's, you know, a very carefree guy. And in contrast to that, you have, you know, Mr. Banks, who, as you noted, 
um, just like P.L. Trout's father, worked in a bank. Uh, everything is very orderly. Um, you know, the, the very opening scenes of uh, the Mary Poppins movie, uh, you know, the, uh, when you, as you meet George Banks, you know, he's, everything is very timed, everything's very on schedule, um, you know, there's no, um, you know, there's no distress in the fact that, uh, there, you know, the, the neighbor adjacent to them sets up, you know, is, I don't know, some uh, retired military man who's setting off bombs uh, at, or explosives anyway, at certain points during the day, this seems to cause distress for some people, but you notice this doesn't cause distress for Mr. Banks at all because because it's scheduled, because it's yeah. routine, because he knows what's happening next. So you have sort of these two very opposite figures um, that end up sort of being this sort of ideal, I, I'm imagining, you know, this sort of ideal paternal, uh, you know, sort of father figure for, for P.L. Travers. That's a great insight. I hadn't really thought about the, kind of the, the amalgamation because, yeah, definitely Bert represents the things she loved about her father. But at the same time, um, you know, I think if, if her father had been more structured, if her father had sort of kept more control of himself and been that sort of Mr. Banks character on the other side a little bit more, um, you know, trying to find that balance between, you know, playfulness and, and, and structure, maybe. Right. So, and, you know, if you, if you watch the, the, the 1964 movie, um, you know, I don't, I don't think you come away immediately with the plot of the movie being about the deconstruction and reconstruction of George Banks. But if you watch the 2013 Saving Mr. Banks, of course, you start off wondering, what does that have to do with Mary Poppins? Mm -hmm. um, but you find you, you end up when you when you watch Mary Poppins again, you know, it through it's in my mind anyway, through a completely different lens, you're recognizing that that's really the story of Mary Poppins is, you know, the deconstruction and reconstruction of the man, the man, George Banks. It's not about, you know, Mary Poppins is the character that sort of facilitates that transformation. And so there's, you know, fun and frivolity along the way, but in the end, it's sort of rather than take, you know, rather than taking the Dick Van Dyke character, the Bert, um, I don't remember what Bert's last name is or if it's even noted, um, it isn't. <laughs> I just looked it up on IMDb. So taking the Bert character and making him more businessman, bank-like is not the, is not seen in my mind anyway as, as an objective or even as a possibility. Uh, which would be sort of the narrative that you would think P.L. Travers would wish for her father to go through. More, it's it's more of the taking the George Banks character and making him a little bit more open to the front and frivolity that was that was part of her father. So in a sense, it's this idea of, um, you know, it doesn't have to be both and, mm -hmm. or it doesn't have to be one or the other. I should say it could be both and um, that George Banks can be the the businessman, the banker who keeps strict hours and, you know, wants to sit down at a piano and know that it's in tune, even though he doesn't know how to play the piano, uh, you know, wants these, you know, sorts of experiences for his children. And yet at the same time is still able to be creative and fun loving and interact with his children. And so that, that it, you know, for the adult who has watched both, you know, a, a second viewing of Mary Poppins is just entirely different than it was, you know, watching it the first time as a eight, nine, ten year old. Well, and also some of the decisions that the, the Mary Poppins filmmakers have made make a little bit more sense as well. Um, for example, the, the scene of, of uh, Mr. Banks walking in the middle of the night um, to, uh, you know, to his bank after uh, he's been fired. Um, it's this really kind of like dark, like, you know, almost sort of Gethsemane <laughs> kind of moment. And he, he arrives at the bank and he's sort of walked in with these two guards on like either side of him, or maybe they're front and back, but it, it definitely, you know, it's, it's like on, on his way to, to be executed. And I think they show, uh, you, you sort of go, well, this is such a strange and kind of almost unnerving scene and they spend so much time on it. And, you know, once you get that, that the Mr. Banks's transformation is supposed to be the, the most significant, uh, you know, a narrative change in the film, you go, oh, okay, well, sure, that makes sense. That, that, you know, they would spend so much attention suddenly on this character. 
and explaining, you know, his, his transformation and what, what's going on with him. Now, so in at least the way that uh, Saving Mr. Banks presents it, as her father is sort of falling into alcoholism and, and is, you know, bedridden, um, suddenly her aunt comes into town, uh, her, her mother's sister, to try to, you know, fix things. And she makes this promise, more or less, that she is going to fix things. And she kind of gets the house back in order. She, of course, has an umbrella with like a, like a bird sculpture on the, on the handle, much like Mary Poppins did. She uh, brings in this bag that has all these sort of strange collection of things in it, much like Mary Poppins did. Mm -hmm. And you sort of get the sense that this is the character who, um, uh, you know, Pamela as a child is hoping is going to be this Mary Poppins. She's going to come in and fix everything. She's going to save her father, which, you know, unfortunately doesn't happen. She's not able to save him. Um, and he does pass away, you know, for, from complications related to his alcoholism. But that's kind of where this this whole narrative comes in. Um, you know, Disney in the film says that, you know, storytellers restore order with imagination. You know, we, we tell, you know, all kinds of stories to, like, help make sense of the world, uh, you know, Marxism or evolution or capitalist greed. We always sort of put these stories out there, these sort of filters on the world to make sense of it. Um, and... You know, Saving Mr. Banks is essentially positing that Mary Poppins is supposed to be the story of redemption that was known by its author to be revisionist, but it was a way for her to try to bring order back to this chaotic situation. You know, so even though her, her real Mary Poppins failed to save Mr. Banks, the fictional one does. And, you know, which I think ties into this longing that we have, uh, uh, you know, this, you know, sort of something sort of inherent to us. Uh, you know, I guess Paul and Jung would talk about it in different ways, but basically it's the same idea. We, we have this desire for redemption, for like a, a, some savior to come in and make things right again, make, make us right again. Um, and, and that seems to be what she's doing with this Mary Poppins character. She, uh, but, but at the same time, it's kind of interesting because she seems to have some mixed feelings about the way the filmmakers are trying to portray Mary Poppins. Um, that she uh, sees Mary Poppins as kind of swooping in and fixing everything, which she sees as not realistic. But on the other hand, she she kind of does want Mary to do that. But I think she's afraid of of, of teaching this false lesson that you know everything can be can be made right again to these children because her own real life Mary Poppins failed to do that. But but I, I do I do think it's interesting this idea of of a kind of a universal need. Um, for meaning and redemption. I wonder, as you, see, you know, watch the film or as you talk to people in your practice, um, how much you see that as, as, as central to, to our own experience. Yeah, well, I, I feel like it's interesting. We, we don't have to, uh, you and Saving Mr. Banks, we don't have to be quite as insightful <laughs> because, <laughs> because uh, you know, the the... The Walt Disney character in in a movie, anyway, flies to to England, you know, to try to to try to sit down with 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 Mrs. Travers. You know, she one of the one of the plot lines throughout the throughout the movie is the idea that she has not yet signed away rights for him to even make this movie, and you know, she's just walked off the set. Uh, you know, to the two the two things that that casual and serious you know disney viewers know about mary poppins the the 1964 movie are the fact that uh julie andrews as the lead you know has you know one you know iconic voice um uh, just an amazing voice and then the the live action sequences with dick van dyke and you know, dancing you know with animated characters and that she insisted that both of those were, you know, did not like that degree of, you know, frivolity with all of this. Anyway, um, so so she she storms off the set, says, you know, she's not going to sign the contract. If I remember correctly, she she actually already had in real life. But anyway, so in, in the movie, she returns back to England. Tom Hanks as Walt Disney uh, follows her, gets the next plane, you know, arrives shortly after she does sits down and talks with her and ta has sort of the same sort of conversation we're having right now where he sort of tries to deconstruct her narrative by saying, 
you know, I think this has to happen. I think this will be helpful for you. I think that, you know, there's this degree of redeeming Mr. Banks. You know, at this point, um, you know, Walt Disney has unearthed the fact that P.L. Travers is not her real name, that in fact, um, you know, Travers is her father's first name. His name was Travers Goff. And, you know, he inde indeed did work at a bank. And some several of these sort of traumatic stories, the sadder moments in the Mary Poppins movie come directly from, you know, from Mrs. Travers' life. And, and Walt Disney recognizes this and sort of lays this out for the audience that, you know, I feel like you need to complete this story. You know, I feel like you're longing for some sort of resolution here. You know, you've got to be able to see your father differently. And so that's a big part of, that's a big part of counseling. You know, people think that counselors are advice givers. And, you know, early on in you know, my sort of orientation session, my first session with people, I explained to them that I'm not an advice giver that my role really is to help people to identify where they are on their journey, you know, sort of how they, and how they need to sort of reconceptualize either where they are or where they've been or where they're going. And, um, and so, so this, again, this, this really, really fits into that idea that um, she's not going to, she can't, you know, a phrase I often say, you know, we can't change the past, right? But we can change the way that we look at the past. And so part of this seemingly is a, how can I look at my father differently? You know, it's sort of the quest that, that Mary Poppins, the book had or seems to have had for, for Mrs. Travers. And so, yeah, there is, it seems to be this sort of universal need to resolve unmet expectations, you know, the sort of universal need to, um, you know, conceptualize or reconceptualize things in a way that does not, that makes the pain redemptive, right? Sort of the, sort of the uh, man's search for meaning, Victor Frankl sort of idea, you know, that I must, there, some, some good must be able to have been, to be seen in, in the, the trauma um, of, of those early childhood experiences. This idea that you said about, um, you know, we can't change the past, but we can change the way we look at it which is, you know, essentially to almost construct a new narrative. Sure. Uh, I, I have wondered a little bit, um, you know, C.S. Lewis called Christianity the myth that is true, um, you know, since it sort of fulfills this universal need for meaning and redemption. But, but he would also say it was supported by the facts, you know. But I, I wondered, you know, if even if like Christianity were false, if it would be worth believing anyway, because it manages to construct this narrative that's psychologically, um, you know, quite useful and helpful. <laughs> uh, you know, you know, but Paul, Paul in, in one place in his letters seems to say otherwise, uh, you know, if there's no resurrection from the dead, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. Um, and maybe that's kind of what Pamela is saying when she is criticizing them for this more um, optimistic view of Mary Poppins is coming and fixing everything. But... I, I do wonder about this, this psychological need for a story like Christianity to be true. Um, would, would that justify believing it even if it were? Do, do we have the, do we have this, this need for this that, you know, e even if there were to God, it would be, it would be good to believe that there was <laughs> just because it would actually provide meaning and structure and a sense of purpose and redemption um, that otherwise would be, would be, you know, missing. Well, you know, early fathers of psychology, you know, the 19th and early 20th century fathers of psychology, you know, most of them not deep religious people, but recognize the value of religion as doing just that, right? The idea that, you know, it's a, it's a primary coping, you know, it's, it's a template upon which primary coping skills can be built and developed and, and those sorts of things. Certainly, I don't think it is just that. But I do recognize that. In fact, one of the things that I have, you know, one of the things that I have been a part of as a, you know, a workshop speaker at, at conferences and those sorts of things is this idea of integrating faith into even secular clinical practice. You know, we have, you know, our, our society is concerned about, you know, any sort of overlap of faith with, 
with clinical practice. And so, you know, counseling students, even in graduate counseling students in particular, those who are seeking licensure, those sorts of things, you know, they have this mindset that, you know, the, the counseling session is not to be you know, a Bible study and it's not to be a, uh, an opportunity to proselytize. And I certainly agree with both of those mindsets. And yet at the same time, the idea that I would be sitting with someone in distress and I would not ask them to reflect on religion and or faith as a construct that provides a sense of comfort for them in their distress or a pathway out or a pathway for meaning, you know, is, is you know, seemingly malpractice to say, well, we're not going to talk about that because that's, you know, that's crossing ethical boundaries. Well, it would be crossing ethical boundaries for me to use that opportunity to, to proselytize. I get that. That's not, that's not the role of a counselor, particularly in a, in a secular setting. But, you know, the idea that we would abandon any sense of, you know, investigation or, development of coping strategies that have faith at the center is is just ludicrous because a, a, a large majority of people talk about finding comfort in their distress through you know matters of faith yeah yeah and i i, I recall um in at least one of the classes that uh, that i took from you um it was in the reading and i think you may have made this comment as well during one of the lecture periods um that in the past, psychoanalysis had tended to want to move away from um, religious thinking and talk, even when talking to a religious client where it would be helpful, uh, because they sort of, you know, patronizingly thought of it as, you know, encouraging neurosis or whatever. But that has changed significantly as um, the profession is sort of seeing how important and useful um, religious uh, ideas and thought can be. So even if you have a secular counselor, if he's dealing with a, a client that's you know Jewish or Christian or Muslim or whatever, they'll they'll look for connections in their in their faith tradition um, to, I think you know be useful you know therapeutically in in, in their sessions, and um, I you know, and you mentioned Fr Victor Frankl earlier who, who wrote you know Man's Search for Meaning and that was a big thing for him that mm -hmm. um, you know was, he was in a concentration camp he noticed that people who had a sense of meaning or purpose. Um, tended to survive, and those who didn't tended not to. <laughs> and that um, if you know, e even on like an atheistic worldview where there is no God, well, you know, what would be what would be so wrong in believing something that's false if it's uh, useful <laughs> for your uh, flourishing and development and and, and uh, you know, living? And so I think there has been this sort of pragmatic, at least, uh, appreciation of religion and in, in counseling that uh, in, in more contemporary counseling is that is that correct yeah yeah and i hope we're continuing to move in that direction you know i i, I feel as though you know i do visiting residencies and and such at a variety of different graduate schools and and yeah and some of them even even those that purport to be uh integrative purport to be you know have faith as a large component will still say now, in a secular setting, you're going to want to make sure that you're not bringing up matters of faith. And even still, I feel as though, you know, I sort of try to respond to that by saying, well, you know, again, it's not that this is an opportunity to evangelize, but but definitely, you know, the, the need for, to, for us to help our clients to sort of explore their religiosity. Um, again, not that not that Christianity is just, you know, a adaptive coping strategy, um, but, you know, that, that it is. And that in a sense, withholding that information, you know, may be considered, may be considered malpractice. So, so think about it this way. Think about, like, with your own, in fact, one of Dr. Bowlby's students actually created an environment uh, called the strange situation to sort of measure this idea of attachment to make sure that children are getting or at least measuring you know how children respond to to stress and distress and so imagine if uh, this is augmented on that idea just brief a little bit just to make it simpler but you know imagine if you're in a in a, a new a new environment a new setting maybe you're visiting uh you know extended family or something like that and you have your your young child with you you know 12, 14, 18 months, 
something like that. And there's a pile of toys in the corner and you say to your child, Hey, I'd like, you know, go ahead and play with those toys. And the child's old enough to understand the direction and they start sort of toddling in that direction, you know, walking, crawling, depending on their age and development or whatever. And they tend to turn back, you know, they, they take a few steps and they turn back and they look at their primary caregiver, sort of a, am I on the right, right track? Like, did I understand you correctly? Am I doing what I'm supposed to be doing? And, you know, as the parent, you're back there, you're smiling, you're nodding, and you're saying, you know, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. And it sort of gives the child permission to continue to explore. You know, they've never been there before. This is a little risky for them. And so you've sort of given them permission to do that. And so you think about what, what would happen for a child who, when they turn back to look at their primary caregiver, sort of like, am I headed in the right track? Am I doing the right thing? And they turn back and that caregiver is disinterested or that caregiver is not even present any longer. Maybe a new person is in the room, which, which is sort of the basis of this, this strange situation uh, component. You know, the child would, would turn back and not only would the mother or, or other primary caregiver not be in the room, but now a stranger is in the room. That causes distress in the child. It should cause distress in the child. It does in the vast majority of cases. And then how does that child respond when the mother comes back into the room or the primary caregiver, caregiver come back into the room? You know, they should be easily consolable. They should be, okay, now I feel safe. Now I can go explore again, as opposed to the child who, um, you know, is either tries to punish the caregiver, like, why did you leave me? you know, sort of thing, or in a sense, being, you know, completely inconsolable when they're picked up. And, and yeah, we're talking about something that's, you know, around the age of one, you know, certainly under the age of two. And yet yeah, that sort of template is created where we recognize whether or not someone is, whether or not I can see my parent as someone who is trustworthy, and therefore is the world at large trustworthy? Is my parent not trustworthy, not available, because I'm not worth it? Right. And how, what sort of implications does that have long term? Right. That when when the child seeks closeness, they don't get it. And so then they end up either, like I said, reacting against the reacting against the caregiver, even when the nurture is trying to be provided. Um, you know, I think of a story that I heard in graduate school where um, one of the psychologists that I took, I took a course from had been hired to do an evaluation of a particular child that was at a particular daycare. And he went in and he was, you know, observing this one particular child and making notes and that sort of thing. And while he was there, uh, a father, a young father came in pushing a, uh, pushing a baby, pushing an infant in a stroller. And he was talking on, the, on his cell phone at the same time and sort of pushed the stroller into the room. Didn't, you know, there's no hug goodbye, no kiss, no, uh, you know, daddy will see you later, that sort of thing. Just sort of pushed the child uh, in the stroller into the center of the room and walked out of the door. And the psychologist sitting there again, not observing that child, but observing another child, um, you know, ended up saying to one of the staff members, wow, what's, what's the situation here? What's the story here? I noticed that this child is not interacting with his peers. He's not even, he's not asking to get out of the stroller. He's just sort of sitting there. And the staff member, uh, the response was, oh yeah, I know. He's so easy. Well, what a great kid. Uh, you know, he doesn't really have any sort of, you know, he's not screaming and yelling to get out. And the psychologist's response was, you understand this is not a good thing, right? It seems more to me like this child has been so emotionally deprived of, you know, safety and security by primary caregivers that he feels he's given up, you know, he, it's, it's, it's easier to just remain buckled in my, my stroller than it is to try to get out and interact with my peers. And so you think of how that, what, what does that person look like when they grow up? Mm. You know, that, that child who, who sat in the stroller, um, you know, interacted that way. And so in, in this, in the storyline of saving Mr. Banks, you have this situation with PL Travers where she's growing up in a home where mom is, is, is emotionally distant, probably has her own set of, you know, pathologies herself. And she's got a father who's struggling with alcoholism. She yearns to be like him. In fact, he makes, uh, you know, she makes a state, the young PL Travers as a girl makes a comment to her father Something like, um, like, I want to be you when I grow up. You know, this is a man who has, who keeps on losing jobs and struggling with alcohol. I, mean, I think 
at this point in the movie, you know, that, that part is very clear. And yet this is who she wants to be when she grows up. And indeed, when she does grow up and, you know, and writes, writes these, this set of children's literature, she takes on her father's, you know, first name as her pen name. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's this really intriguing storyline that, um, she has this, again, this, um, pathological in a sense closeness uh to towards her father despite the trauma that she'd gone through and yet you can see how this has significantly impacted even casual relationships for her you know she gets on the airplane and you know, she's flying across the atlantic and there's a there's a, a mother with a small child on the airplane as well and she says something like well i hope you know, I hope the, the I hope this child's not going to be a nuisance. Or, or yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> right, right after the woman has uh, given up uh, her um, her spot on the um, on the luggage rack for her. Right, right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And and all the way all the way through, and this this is particularly true early in, early in the Saving Mr. Banks film. Like you, it's making it clear that this is an extremely rigid woman, right? This is you know she's extremely structured. In fact, when somebody calls her. Um, when, you know, she doesn't. She doesn't want to be called P.L. Travers. She does not want to be called Mrs. Travers. She does not want to be called Pamela or even Pamela Travers. She wishes to be called Mrs. P.L. Travers and corrects everyone, including Walt Disney. Every time he says Pamela, she hmm. says Mrs. P.L. Travers. Um, you know, there's all sorts of, of components along the way where she seems to be um, almost emotionally unavailable. You know, the the you mentioned uh, Paul Giamatti, who's a favorite actor um, of mine, you know, he's, he, as I understand it, his, his character is sort of a conglomeration. It's like a whole bunch of different characters together that she didn't have that close of a relationship with the person who was the, the chauffeur. <clears throat> but even in, even there at the beginning components, you know, he's, he's trying to establish small talk with her. He's trying to engage. He knows that he's going to spend the next number of days, weeks, maybe months, um, you know, sort of as her personal assistant and, you know, and she is just shooting that down at every moment, you know, the very opposite of what you would think her biological father would have done, you know, just being this very outspoken, you know, so anyway, so yeah, in my mind, this, this, this movie really, uh, answers a lot of questions you didn't even know you had, uh, when you watched Mary Poppins, but mm -hmm. at the same time, you know, for my students, it's it's really eye-opening to see how how much of her daily interactions go right back there's a, there's a i'm going stream of conscious here consciousness here sorry but there's a moment where she walks into the suite that she has at disney properties there in hollywood and there's you know the room is just full of toys you know full of things that her father would have loved you know she's repulsed by it she wants them to be removed she looks down at the at the uh, the centerpiece on the table, and there's fruit there. And she picks up the fruit. She walks out on the terrace, and she throws the pears into the public swimming pool. And this is you know this is less than ten minutes into the movie, and you don't know why. You know you know there must be some meaning there, and it is a good hour and a half later that you realize that on her deathbed, on his deathbed, I'm sorry, um, Travers Goff, P.L. Travers' father, says to his adolescent, young, early adolescent daughter, um, she says, I have some tuppence, right? And, and what would you like for me to get for you? And he says, pears, right? And she leaves to go get pears. And when she comes back, and she drops the pears, and because she drops the pears and has to clean up the pears that she has dropped, she ends up walking into the room moments after her father has passed away. Right? This happened at age, I don't know, eight, nine, ten, maybe something, maybe younger than that, seven, eight, nine. And here now in the movie, she's she's in her sixties. And when she sees pears, she is so repulsed that she throws them, this, you know, she throws them into the public swimming pool. And so, so often, you know, clients that I've seen, people that I've interacted with, situations I've consulted with, you know, you've got the situation where there's this traumatic memory that may not seem to have any sort of significance to us. Mm -hmm. And yet 
when she sees pears, that's immediately what she thinks of. Takes her immediate. In fact, I think in the movie, that's what triggers the very first, the very first flashback for her. It doesn't flash back to that moment with the pears, but it flashes back to, uh, you know, growing up in in Australia as a, as a young girl. Hmm. Yes. So, you know, lot, lots of things with clients and with you and I as well. You know, I play a certain song. I show you a certain uh, a certain board game uh, or a certain cartoon from your childhood, uh, maybe a smell, you know, that sort of thing. You, you walk back into grandma's house for the first time in several years and immediately you're transported, you know, metaphysically to uh, to an entirely different context. And for people where childhood has been full of traumatic experiences, um, you know, that, that interplay um, can be quite traumatic again as an adult. Well, and it, it almost can serve to make you an entirely different person. I, it was, there was a strange line that I, I think was not supposed to be taken literally, where when Walt Disney realizes after she's left that her name is not P.L. Travers, but Helen Goff, and he says something like, "Was I talking to the wrong person?" And you think, "Well, that's a kind of a silly thing to say." But but what he's what he's saying is what he's really saying. The meaning behind that phrase is not literally, "Did did, did they send me the wrong person? Did I get the wrong person?" You know, that actual different, entirely different individual. But was the person who I was talking to this sort of construction over the real person? Um, I think, and that, so he, at that point, he, he begins to say, okay, there's this person underneath here that I need to be, that I need to reach. The person who I've been talking to is this facade. Right. Absolutely. And there, that's a storyline that's woven through several times where, you know, in my, my classes are 45, you know, they're, they're, they're long enough or short enough, I should say that the movie ends up being broken into two separate class periods while, while I'm gone. And I tell them to stop this film uh, at the point where, uh, where Walt Disney makes the comment um, about Mary Poppins coming in to save the children. And, and the Peel Travers character turns to the Walt Disney character and says, do you think that that's what this is about? Do you think Mary Poppins is coming to save the children? You know, and I say, okay, stop it there. Um, you know, and, you know, because that sort of is the assumption, but the more, like I said, watching Mary Poppins through fresh eyes, which I did, you know, just this weekend, um, you know, sat down with my, uh, let's see, sixth and seventh kids. So my, my five-year-old and, and three-year-old, and I don't think, I don't know if they've watched the, the 1964 version before, but I sat down and watched it with them again, you know, just learning new things, observing new things, having seen it several times now, but seeing it in the light of the Saving Mr. Banks narrative. Uh, you know, another component that, that, uh, that Disney mentions, you know, is he talks to, uh, you know, this is after, you know, he, he goes back to England, uh, sort of chases her down and wants to talk to her. And he mentions that he understands her, the fact that the Travers, ha you know, sort of sees these characters as family members because he says they are family and he talks about his own situation having sort of conceptualized mickey mouse and having an employer uh you know that he was working with at that time um back in missouri i think it was who said you know i'd like to buy the rights to this mickey mouse character and and walt you know back then saying you know this is too important to me you know mickey mouse is a family member to me and um yeah it's just you know, so so Travers then, you know, uh, as, as they're sort of creating, you know, the of course the, the Sherman brothers are, are writing the songs and, and some of the dialogue is being teased out throughout the process of the movie. And as this is sort of coming to light to Travers, you know, some of the, the fictionalized stories, the, you know, the Mr. Banks character ripping up the letter uh, where the children say, you know, this is what we'd like in an A&E and some things like that. And this, this altercation at the bank where, you know, he's sort of fighting his children. Um, you're sort of shame, trying to shame them into the box that he would like them to be in. You know, Travers goes to the, the creative team, the, the, the Bradley Whitford character and the Sherman brothers and says, you know, why can't, why can't, why can't he live well? Right. Why can't Mr. Banks be a nice guy? You know, and she then she, like, why, why is he so cruel or something? Yeah, like why that. is he so cruel? Yeah. And then she turns away from them. Of course, we can see it as in the camera. 
that she turns away and she walks away and under her breath she says i feel like i let him down again mm -hmm. right like suddenly i'm going to get emotional talking to you about this over you know over the phone but you know the just this idea that you know here as you said like this is a story of redemption like the point of all of this is supposed to be that when he's confronted oh, i'd like to say with the truth of the gospel but when he's confronted with the idea that there is a place for fun and frivolity even in the life of a very structured banker george banks you know that he can embrace that and and at this point in the movie, whether she either hasn't seen the script or that part isn't quite fully developed yet, in the movie, it, the implication is that they've not yet written, let's go fly a kite, you know, that sort of thing. You know, in her mind, it's like, here, I'm trying to, I've finally given up control, not of the Mary Poppins character, but of the George Banks character. I've finally given up control. And, and here, this creative team is making him, as you just reminded me, cruel, and, you know, it's this, I've let him down again. Not only could I not help my dad get any better, not only could I not deliver the pairs that he requested, but now I'm presenting him to the world, not, you know, as, as this mean person. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's, it's a very moving moment in the, a very moving moment in the, in the movie. Well, and it seems that, you know, what the, the, the connection between her father and the Mr. Banks in the story is, is that he needs to be able to love his children enough that he shows it in ways that are healthy and appropriate and that they can experience it. in. and, you know, the, the reality is that, you know, the film is called saving Mr. Banks. And she says that it's not about saving the children, but, you know, Disney, when he's speaking with her near the end of the film, when he goes to visit her in England, he does say, you know, he does make the, this connection that, you know, by saving Mr. Banks, um, this also heals her wounds. And that by, you know, by, by, right. by, 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 you know, redeeming her father, it heals her wounds, just like by saving Mr. Banks in the film, by redeeming that character, it also affects um, his children's well-being and their relationship with him and, and you know, their, you know, psychological, <laughs> you know, well-being. Sure. Sure, the idea that we can't, like I said, the idea that we can't change the past, but we can change the way we look at it. And and so, you know, for instance, you know, doing PTSD treatment with some with a, uh, a combat soldier returning home, you know, we can't change, you know, there, there was a, a school of thought, you know, you know, 50 years ago, you know, probably World War II era, um, you know, where it was, well, let's minimize triggers. You know, we don't want people to think about what's happened to them. Well, that's that's not very effective because you suddenly you have people coming home from World War II or coming home from the Vietnam War or whatever, and you know they're smelling fresh, uh, fresh, fresh asphalt, and that's bringing back um, you know the smell of napalm or whatever, or they're they're seeing an Asian person walking down the street, or they're hearing music that you know, or they're smoking cigarettes, whatever it is. There's all sorts of things that are, you know, there's no way to minimize all these triggers. And so treatment then becomes not being able to avoid the triggers, but being able to cope through the triggers, right? Being able, and, and one way to do that is to, one effective way to do that is to try to quote unquote complete the narrative, right? So make meaning out of it. Like don't be thinking about that one particular solitary isolated moment. Think about how that particular moment impacted the end game. Right, maybe even the end game that isn't all the way here yet. And so, when I have a young person or a not so young person sitting in my office who's disclosing to me, you know, childhood sexual abuse, I, I, I can't, I can't tell them. Well, if you'll do this, this, and this, you won't think about it anymore. The answer, you know, the 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 quest then becomes: when you think about it, think about it this way. Right, complete mm -hmm. the narrative. Right, find a way to make meaning. Find a way for, you know, allow God to redeem this situation, you know, for his glory and for your edification. And so that's sort of the, you know, what's, what seemingly Disney is trying to encourage her to do. Like, let this happen. Let us, let us resolve this, uh, which then becomes, you know, the Sherman Brothers, let's go fly a kite, uh, you know, and then the end of the movie, whether it really was, you know, completely rescripted um, or not to help facilitate you know this idea of healing for for travers you know the, the very ending becomes this very integrated um 
you know, a banker can have fun, right? And somebody who likes orderliness uh, can have fun. And in fact, I didn't even think about this component until uh, until just watching it over the last few days. At the very the very end of the movie, uh, you know, so Banks, as you mentioned, t- you know, talks about this sort of destitute walk back to back to the bank where he's going to get fired and lose his job. And his response is not to withdraw. His response is he starts to laugh. He he tells a joke, uh, a joke that he you know sort of chastised his children for when they did it. You know, he tries to explain explain supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. You know, to to the members of the board there. You know, they fire him. He leaves. Uh, you find out. You know, I guess he's gone uh, through the night uh, on to the next day. You don't know where he is. And, of course, he's in the basement uh, or somewhere. I think he's in the basement creating a kite. They go out and they they fly a kite. And the bank manager's son, the president of the bank, his son uh, comes to the park and says, I just wanted you to know my father passed away last night. He was laughing at your joke. And now here these bankers are laughing. You know, they're at the park as well. They're all laughing. And it's almost as though... Um, yeah, I mean, I haven't teased all this through yet because I've never really processed it this quite this deeply. But it's almost as though not only was there transformation of George Banks, but because George Banks was transformed and living that transformation out authentically, there was systemic change, mm. right? In that even the even the bank president, even the whole structure that caused him to be this. Um, you know, very, very rules oriented, very, uh, very structured, very, you know, this is what a, a, an English, an Englishman should be. Um, you know, his, his means of authentically living out his transformation before them really sort of changed the whole system. Yeah. And, and I like what you said a, a couple minutes ago about the, um, you know, completing the narrative and, um, you know, another way to describe that might be like a narrative reversal. You know, you a lot of great films and, and novels, and you know, and, and I would also argue that I mean, the gospel is about this, is about taking uh, certain ideas, themes, events, and then that are that are traumatic or, or negative, and then reversing them, showing them in, in uh, you know, in an opposite, basically in their opposite. Um, and yeah, that, and that's absolutely, I think, what uh, what, what's what's trying to happen. What, what's what's kind of happening here? I mean, I, I think particularly with the character of Mary Poppins, where um, you know, th- there's this character, you know, her aunt, who is you know, the, the archetype for Mary Poppins, and makes this promise, but that she doesn't complete. And then you have this film now, or this book, uh, and then the film, where Mary Poppins does do the job, and you know, and you you sort of have all these you know sort of mirror events where um, you know something is reversed uh, in the narrative that, that that suddenly redeems the situation um, and yeah and, and I like your, your your connection there with uh, with triggers as well I think that's that's a that's very astute that that you know you can't avoid that those kinds of things forever but you have to find a way of putting them into a new context um, mm. where where they can you know they don't have that same negative power that they that they once did. Yeah, I mean, there's just so much, oh, you know, there's so many ways to just sort of peel back the onion. I mean, I know we're already taking up a lot of time, but, you know, you could, you could, in a sense, we could have had this whole conversation and not talked about P.L. Travers upbringing at all. We could have talked about how this movie is about Walt Disney, right? Mm-hmm. And how, uh, you know, he had, you know, he tells a story about his own father, right? And it's the idea that, you know, I could never please, I could never please my father, right? He, he says this in this, in this, very meaningful conversation with Travers back in England. You know, he talks about a story where, you know, it's cold, there's snow, and the father is still, you're going to deliver your newspapers or whatever it is that his boyhood job was. I think it was newspapers. Um, and yet, you, if you think way back to the very beginning of the movie, you find out that for 20 years, for 20 years, he has been begging P.L. Travers to negotiate the movie rights for this. Why? Because this is the favorite book of one of Walt Disney's daughters, right? And and he makes the comment. Um, I've written it down here somewhere. He makes the comment about you know early on in the movie that you know like this is what fathers do, right? This is this is what fathers do. They 
they find ways to please their children and um they, yeah they, that, they that, that's what being, that's what being a dad is all about you know and so for 20 years you know all of these accommodations all of this all of this uh negotiation all of this dynamic is because is because um Disney doesn't want to be the disappointing dad, right? I can't, you know, his, da his daughters are, now I think it actually wasn't 20 years, but it was a long time, um, you know, and so the, this, the, you know, these are not child age girls now, you know, Disney's, Disney's daughters are adults, and yet he's still like, I can't let my children down. I can't, you know, I must do this. You know, and so that in a sense goes all the way back to, uh, all the way back to, to I keep thinking of Tom Hanks because <laughs> that's what Tom Hanks does to you, right? Um, but you know, it's it's it goes all the way back to Walt Disney and his own childhood, and it's this idea of um, you know I want to you know I want to provide this for my daughters in a way that maybe wasn't necessarily provided for me as a child. Yeah. Well. Um I think we're, we're, we probably should start wrapping up, but I, uh, <laughs> were there any, uh, any closing thoughts? And then I was going to have uh, one last question also. Um, so yeah, the only, the concluding thoughts, I guess that I would have uh, before, before your question, just this idea, going back to this idea of attachment and saying, you know, because of those sorts of interactions uh, as a young child and not feeling safety and security really from either child, it was very difficult for, um, for P.L. Travers to sort of take risks. Um, and, you know, the more you read about her personal life, the more you realize that's, that's true even, even more than it's conceptualized on the screen. You know, failed relationships, failed attempts at, attempts at adoption. The, the, the chaos, the lack of security that she found in her early childhood really was played out over and over and over again um, throughout, throughout her life. Now, that doesn't mean that it can't be redeemed. And, and that, we won't talk, take the time to talk about that either, but, you know, in class, we always talk about how the power of music, right, and the Sherman Brothers and the humor that's all in there and how, uh, you know, she goes from being this very, uh, very hostile, very aggressive part of the creative team to actually dancing with, uh, you know, with the Bradley Whitford character, singing along with Let's Go Fly a Kite and all of this sort of thing, that it's almost as though, uh, those of us who are emotional, he emotionally healthy, or like to see ourselves as emotionally healthy, that we have this, um, you know, we almost have this responsibility to to reach out to these people and to uh, sort of create this new level of safety and security that they didn't have, that they didn't have as children. So, uh, yeah, lots of places to sort of springboard off of in in watching this movie. It takes us a couple of a couple of class periods to deconstruct and. Uh, and talk through each of these dynamics. Wow, that was great thoughts. Um, yeah, I really appreciate you, you uh, taking the time to do this and, and your insights. And uh, my, my last question was, it was interesting to watch is there, you know, at this Disney empire and, uh, you know, Disneyland and all this other stuff. And uh, seeing Tom Hanks as Disney there, it's, it's hard not to wonder, uh, you know, is, is Disney an egomaniac or, or surrogate father to the world's children, you know, to, to have this whole theme park built around his name and uh, what, you know, is, is that, a, is, is there a, what's, what's your, what's your, I know you're not supposed to do diagnoses of yeah. celebrities or anything <laughs> that you haven't actually treated. But. Yeah. Well, yeah. Disney is an interesting study, you know, himself. You, know, you think about th recurring themes in his in many 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 of the stories that he has produced. Um, so, for instance, the concept of a an evil stepmother. You know, you wonder what <laughs> what the uh, the female caregivers in his life must have been that he you know he so sort of pushes that sort of narrative. Um, and I did I did do some reading on some of the you know the historical accuracy of that. So, as, as I understand it, he did he arranged for Travers to take this trip around Disney World. He did not accompany her, but but the point that he did walk through, you know, Disneyland, uh, you know, in California quite often, and that he did have business cards that he'd already signed because so many people wanted his signature, um, you know, that those sorts of things were were true to life, and that yeah, that he definitely saw himself as, um, 
yeah, this is sort of the surrogate father figure, you know, from the educational films, the documentaries that he did, you know, to try to educate people. So, yeah, I know I do feel as though in, in a number of, not just Mary Poppins, the movie, where, you know, it does seem as though Disney, and I'm not, I've not read a Disney biography or whatever. I've seen some, some documentary type things, but, you know, that he felt this obligation to, to, um, to fill this sort of surrogate father role in mm. in the child, you know, the children of that era. Dr. Graham, thank you so much for your time and for uh, for recommending this movie. It's one I actually hadn't seen before, and it was uh, I was glad to have made time to watch it. And it also made me uh, dust off my VHS of Mary Poppins and um, <laughs> watch that with my daughter. And uh, she hadn't she'd seen it once when she was two. I didn't really remember it, and she's five now. And uh, she, and she likes watching old movies and stuff, but I wasn't totally sure she would get into it or not she's not always into musicals but she uh she really liked it a lot oh so. that's great all right well thank you so much dr graham and i'll uh hope to talk to you soon all right sounds good